All right, Alexander, let's talk about what is happening in Ukraine. And on the front lines, is it me or has have things quieted down a bit, at least on the front lines? That's that's how it seems. Yeah, that, um, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's yeah. any doubt about it. And um, we've had, we have a lull and I, I, I'm sure it is connected with the Christmas holiday. I mean, there's been no formal announcement of a Christmas truce. But I think that the Russian military and Putin have taken a decision that the, the men on the front line deserve a rest. And that's what they've been given. So, I mean, we've had a, we have a lull on the front lines and probably this will continue for a couple more days. Maybe next week we'll start to see things happen a little bit more, <laughs> you know, with a little bit more energy. But it's important to stress this is the front lines, the actual what's going on on the ground in the air. It's completely different. Missile strikes going on all the time. And of course, the political crisis in Kiev continues. And Putin's got a lot to say okay. about things politically. Right yeah. Now. So, uh, yeah. OK, so let's let, let's talk about the, the political situation uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky is doing a tour of the Baltic uh, nations, asking for for money and uh, building the narrative of Russia invading the Baltic nations. That's what this trip is, is really about. And uh, Putin is traveling in the Far East. He said some very interesting things about the Russian economy, especially compared to the economies of the European Union. But uh, just to continue on the topic of what's going on on the battlefield, uh, we do have uh, missile strikes from uh, from the Russian side, specifically targeting Kharkiv. Uh, I think they've they've really singled out Kharkiv over the past couple of days. Um, last week, it seemed like they were singling out uh, Kiev uh, and Odessa, but uh, Kharkiv seems to be a target for the Russian military with with uh, missiles and drones. And the Ministry of Defense says that they're targeting um, hotels where mercenaries are are located. Obviously, Ukraine officials they are saying that these are hotels uh, housing journalists and uh, aid workers. So uh, l- let's start with. What's going on on the ground? You mentioned the war in the air is uh, is very active. And then we could talk about Zelensky's travels and what's going on in Kiev, all the palace intrigue. And then we could talk about Putin's travels and everything that is going on in Russia with the Russian economy. Mm. Absolutely. Let's 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 indeed start with. Um, as I said, the situation on the front ground, front lines. And as I said, we are seeing a lull. The fewer uh, Russian attacks. In fact, in one or two places, like Sinkovka near Kupiansk, for example, the Russians even pulled back a bit. But generally, they are continuing this policy um, more quietly at the moment, but they're continuing this policy of putting, continue to keep pressure on the Ukrainians all the time. And we've had a, a lot of information now coming out of Ukraine about the effect that all of this is causing in terms of casualties. And the very interesting thing is that Russian figures about Ukrainian casualties and Ukrainian figures about Ukrainian casualties, and I want to stress these are informal figures, but they are starting to match up. And this is really very interesting. So we've had the former prosecutor general of Ukraine, Yuri Lutsenko, who was um, somebody, by the way, who was involved. Americans may remember him. He played a role in the first Trump impeachment case. Anyway, he now says that over the course of the entire war, Ukraine has lost half a million men dead and or severely wounded. We've had um, doctors, Ukrainian doctors, telling ABC that Ukraine is losing men at the rate of 30,000 a month, dead or severely wounded. That is 1,000 men a day. Okay, just, just, just to get some sense of what that means. And the Russian defense ministry, the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, said that over the course of 2023, according to Russian calculations, the Ukrainians lost 215,000 men dead or severely wounded, which, if you think about it, 
correlates quite closely with these Ukrainian figures. And this is, this is the effect of the way in which the Russians are conducting the war, which is they're working towards depleting Ukrainian forces on the battlefields. They're conducting attrition. We've discussed this many times. In the summer, they conducted defensive attrition. They let the Ukrainians attack them, and they depleted the Ukrainians massively over the course of the summer offensive. This the In the autumn that has just passed, and currently this winter, and again, Shoigu set this out. He had a meeting in the defense ministry in Moscow. He explained this all there. The Russians are attacking, but they're not engaging in a general offensive. We've discussed this many times. They're only working with a fraction of their army. We've also discussed this many times. But they're in still inflicting massive losses on Ukraine. And so we've gone from defensive attrition in the summer to what I've called aggressive attrition this you know this autumn and winter. And that is the tactic. It is to gradually weaken the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians now tell us that Russian military units on the battlefronts are 95 percent up to strength. We've had previous reports that Ukrainian units are around 60 percent strength. So it's starting to see what the difference is. And we can start to see the effect that this is having. It's exhausting the Ukrainian army. It's depleting its manpower reserves. And of course, it's depleting the stocks of ammunition and weapons that the West has been supplying to Ukraine. And we can know all about the crisis of that. And in the meantime, even as this aggressive attrition continues on the battlefronts, see the Russians conducting a different kind of aggressive attrition through the, through the air. And we've now got lots of photos coming through from Kiev, from the strikes on the 3rd the, the and 8th of January. We've had more pictures from places like Melnitsky of the effect of the Russian strikes on the 8th of January. We've seen, as you correctly say, more Russian missile and drone strikes on Kharkov. And this is clearly now becoming a key target for the Russians. And it's clear that Ukrainian air defences are not working. The Russians are inflicting massive damage on Ukraine's military industrial complex. We're seeing warehouses destroyed. We're seeing factories destroyed. And they're now focusing on Kharkiv. And that begs the question, why are they focusing so much on Kharkiv? Well, Kharkiv is Ukraine's biggest, second biggest city. It is a major industrial center. Uh, one of the big tank factories, the Malyshev factory, um, is located there. So in that respect, Kharkiv is clearly a target of some sort. But inevitably now, there are growing rumors starting to spread in Ukraine and in the West, some of the ones in the West originating from Britain, that the Russians are thinking of some kind of offensive in the Kharkiv area, maybe targeting Kharkiv itself, maybe tar targeting other places around Kharkiv, and that this is why these strikes on Kharkiv are taking place on the scale that they are. And they're attacking, as you correctly said, hotels where the Russians say mercenaries are based. But one also gets the sense that they're attacking <clears throat> industrial factories, logistical bases, commands, command positions, all of that sort of thing. And it seems to be taking place now on a big scale and all the time. And once again, no sign that Ukrainian air defences are succeeding. Now, I'm going to explain, express my own personal view. I don't think the Russians are yet ready to launch a general offensive. I think that they're still in the working hard to prepare for that. I think they would need many more troops on the front lines than they have at the moment. I'm getting reports about the equipment buildups that are happening. I know one location, one location where the Russians have stockpiled around a million shells, 
And that's just one place along the front lines. Um, so I don't personally think that they're ready yet for a big offensive in Kharkiv. But they're hammering Kharkiv. Kharkiv is close to Belgorod, which Ukraine is shelling, you know, sporadically. But it's, an, it's something that the Russians want to counter. And as I said, it is this big industrial center. And I think, again, it's keeping the Ukrainians on the back foot. It's keeping the Ukrainians very, very worried about what the Russians might be planning in Kharkiv. And there was a big meeting uh, about a day or so ago um, in this area, which brought together Zaluzhny, the, gra- the, you know, the overall military commander, Sirsky, and the ground forces commander. And Sirsky and Zaluzhny are known to be on very bad terms, but they had to come together. And the defense minister, the Ukrainian defense minister, Rustem Umerov, was there. So all of these three people came together in this area, in the Kharkiv region, clearly worried about the situation, wondering what to do, uh, probably going to commit more of Ukraine's um, dwindling reserves to trying to hold positions in Kharkiv, worried about these Russian strikes um, on Kharkiv city itself, the Russians conducting aggressive attrition and keeping the Ukrainians guessing about their intentions. Yeah, big big mistake to uh, to launch the attacks against Belgorod from the uh, the Ukraine military from the Zelensky regime. That was a big mistake. Something tells me that Kharkov moved moved up in in the priority list because of those those attacks. Just a hunch, uh, but you know if if they go after Kharkiv and um, not not even in an offensive, if they just keep the pressure on Kharkiv. Then that that really uh, crushes uh, Zelensky's um, Crimea, uh, Kherson bridgehead uh, narrative. I mean, you, you know, they're not Ukraine doesn't. It, it's not going to be able to commit to to both uh, regions, and so the more they're going to commit to Kharkiv, because the Russians Russians keep the pressure on Kharkiv, the more unbelievable and ridiculous. Zelensky's big selling point, which is the bridgehead from Kherson to Crimea, becomes. Uh, oh, absolutely. That's, that's obvious, yeah. I, I don't think anybody apart from Zelensky himself and a few people around him take that idea seriously. And I think that the Americans are dead against it for once. I think the Americans, having been very badly burnt with a summer offensive, don't want to see a repetition. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's debatable whether Zelensky has the resources to conduct an offensive in her some region at all. But if most Ukrainian reserves have to be committed to defending Kharkiv or the area around that against, you know, possible Russian offensive there, that's not going to leave anything for an offensive in her some region. Now, um, about Belgorod, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Belgorod, you know, again... It's one of these things that makes no strategic, military, tactical, political sense. Now, a lot of people say these are sort of terror raids. They are supposed to create disaffection amongst the Russian population, perhaps in the run up to the elections, the presidential election in March. Well, Look at Russia. Look at the size of this country. Count how many cities there are in Russia. Belgorod is one place. I'm not you know, trying to diminish its importance or the seriousness of what is happening in Belgorod. But launching you know, the odd rocket attack on Belgorod, smashing up some buildings there, um, wounding and killing people, it's not going to affect the overall morale of people in Russia, what it's going to make them is angry about what is happening in Belgorod. And for every shell and rocket that uh, the Ukrainians are able to launch at Belgorod, well, we see that the Russians massively outmatch it by the damage that they're doing to Kharkov. And when I say that damage they're doing to Kharkov, I mean they're targeting specific buildings in Kharkov, which do seem to be connected in some way to the Ukrainian war effort, which the attacks on Belgorod 
to all intents and purposes, are not. So it is a completely illogical strategy. But information terms, it sort of works. There's been a report in CNN about deserted streets in Belgorod. There's a sort of attempt to create some kind of atmosphere of crisis in Russia over the events in Belgorod. You talk about, if you're CNN, what's going on in Belgorod. You give it that kind of spin. You ignore the much bigger devastation that has been wreaked on Kharkiv, even though Kharkiv is Ukraine's second biggest city, a major industrial centre. And Belgorod is not. It's not Russia's second biggest city. It's an important city. It's got a lot of industries. But it's not vital to Russia in the way that Kharkiv is. But, you know, that's that's the war that uh, Zelensky has chosen to fight from the very beginning is the media optics narrative war. And uh, CNN is is happy to to uh, take part in in that type of uh, of war. It, it fits CNN's narrative perfectly to, to talk about Belgorod and the abandoned streets and look at look at the defeat that Russia is suffering in in one of its own cities. So, I mean, it's. It plays nicely to to the collective West media. And and that leads us into uh, Zelensky's trip to the Baltics. Uh, Why is he going there? He was in Lithuania the other day, Estonia, Latvia. I think he's going to another uh, country in the the EU. I think I want to say Poland, but I'm not sure. But anyway, he's doing this mini tour of, uh, or or maybe Finland or Sweden. He's doing this mini tour of of Europe, North Europe, the Baltics. Uh, The obvious reason for him to go is the money. I mean, he, he needs the money and the support. But uh, what do you make of this of this trip? Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, he does need money and he does need support. And he knows that in the Baltic states, he's going to get a sympathetic audience. And bear in mind, he's not had that very much when he's gone elsewhere. I mean, his trip to the United States in the autumn is now universally acknowledged to have been an abject failure, in fact, a disaster. And he's just, there's just been an embarrassing event in Austria. He, tele, he you know, apparently made another you know, televised speech to the Austrian parliament. Many Austrian MPs were furious about it. They said it violated Austria's neutrality. You could see the drift, the gradual drift away uh, um, in Austria. And the Italian defence minister is now coming out making um, heretical statements about the fact that Western military aid to Ukraine now needs to be linked in some form to a requirement that Ukraine commit to negotiations. So he wants to go to places, Baltic states, where he knows he's going to get a sympathetic reception. And, you know, that's what he's doing. But the Baltic states are not in a position to give Ukraine money in any quantities. I mean, they're very small. Um, They're not in particularly good economic shape themselves by the way. And of course, as military powers, they're insignificant. And as industrial powers, they're insignificant. So why is he going? Well, I think one of the primary reasons he's going is because he doesn't want to be in Kiev. (laughs) It's as simple as that. I mean, we had this, we've had this with him previously, whenever he can find an opportunity to get away from Kiev now, he, he seizes it. And he goes to the Baltic states. He says some terrible things there, by the way, which people aren't uh, picking up. But he again basically is calling for the destruction of Russia. I mean, I mean, appalling things like this. Nobody criticizes this in the Baltic states. Some people lap it up because they want to see that happen there too. Um, supposedly. That isn't Western policy anyway, but of course we know that in some cases it is. Nobody in the West criticizes him. But as I said, he's able to find a sympathetic audience. He's able to find people who support him. And in the meantime, he gets away from Kiev. And that, I think, is the single most important thing at this time, because the situation in Kiev is becoming increasingly unstable. And the mobilization law is, I suspect, the single thing that is causing the 
greatest problems. Yeah, I remember when they were uh, making fun of Russia with their partial mobilization. They said it was a complete disaster. And Russia, Russia can't do anything right. And, uh, and it was actually a very, a very successful mobilization on the part of Russia. It had its bumps in the beginning, no doubt about it, but it's a big operation. It's a big and complicated operation to mobilize people. But uh, Russia did it. They accomplished it. They accomplished their goals. And, um, you know, they, they, they moved forward. Ukraine's mobilization is, can't even get up off the ground. I mean, this is a complete uh, disaster. But I, I also think another reason for Zelensky's trip to the Baltics is also to, to stir up the fear, the narrative of, of Putin invading Europe. I, I think he, he's hoping He's hoping that Johnson in the in the House or, or or the Republicans that are that are against funding Ukraine are going to listen to his speeches and say, "Oh my God, we better get him sixty billion, or else Putin's going to be marching into into Estonia and then onwards to to France." You know, I think I, I think there is part of part of oh, that. Oh yeah, as well, I mean, to, this is this is in, and it's not just Zelensky, by the way. I mean, there's flesh creeping articles now all over the place. I mean, there's one in the Daily Telegraph today by our old friend, Colonel Hamish de Breton Gordon, saying that if we don't defeat Russia in three uh, in Ukraine, then they will attack us. I mean, literally, you know, carry out a sort of invasion of Europe within three years. I mean, that's what he's saying. I mean, you know, this, this narrative is there. And there's a really a, a shocking film. I mean, I say shocking in multiple levels. Uh, which has come out in Germany, which uh, um, simulates Russian missile strikes on Berlin. <laughs> so, you know, you see you know, Russian missiles crashing into Berlin and smoke and all the rest, and the television tower in Ber Berlin, you know, shrouded in smoke and all of that. And, I mean, you know, th there is a major effort underway to play up this narrative, you know, that if Putin takes... It's always Putin, by the way. If Putin takes Ukraine, he's going to march on to Berlin. And then beyond Berlin, he's going to go on to Paris and uh, London and New York. And, you know, the, the world is his objective. And, you know, you, you could, this, this narrative is absolutely there. And I think it is also being plugged by him, by Zelensky, as I said, relentlessly in the Baltic states. And, of course, in the Baltic states, they do have reasons to be nervous. Let's be straightforward about I mean, they're tiny. They can't defend themselves against the Russians. They know that perfectly well. They must be very, very worried about uh, the drift of events in Ukraine and about the fact that the West is losing. It's Many people in the West are starting to become sceptical about this continued war in Ukraine. But... You know, who ultimately do they have to blame for this except themselves? I mean, they have supported the most extreme anti-Russian positions now ever since um, they gained the independence of the Soviet Union. They um, um, were told when they joined NATO that they should make a serious effort from that point on to try to mend relations with Russia. They did the exact opposite. They pursue these intense anti-Russian positions, intense anti-Russian policies. And so, of course, now that it's all coming apart, they are starting to feel nervous. And they're saying, well, you know, if Ukraine goes down, if the Americans aren't able to save Ukraine, what chances have we? The reality is that the Russians have no interest in attacking the Baltic states, no um, intention to occupy them. And I think this is a universal view. I don't think anybody in Russia thinks otherwise. So um, they're not actually threatened unless they themselves do something really stupid, which is unlikely, but not impossible, like perhaps stop participating in the war in Ukraine themselves in some ways, or doing something with respect to Belarus, in which case, of course, the situation will become even worse for them than it is already. But, you know, they brought this on themselves and they don't seem to have any ability to take a step back and think about what they've done. Yeah, they got uh, drunk on, on the neocon uh, 
promises of, of, of global domination. They bought into all of that. Uh, they, they bought into the narrative that uh, the sanctions are going to destroy the Russian government and Putin's going to fall. So they, they bought all of that. And, and they were, they were 100% behind uh, the Biden White House and, and the neocon plan to destroy Russia. And um, it wasn't only Russia, you know, they, they went hard against China as well. People forget that Lithuania went hard against China. So, I mean, they've made foreign policy, I don't even, I think blunders is just too, too nice of a word to be quite honest. Uh, so, so yeah, you're, you're exactly right. They have no one to blame but, but themselves for this position because I think they all understand that, that deep down inside, they understand that sooner or later, the U.S. is going to leave them and NATO is going to, to disappear. They understand that. And when that happens, they're in very big trouble. Not not from a Russian invasion. I just think they're in big trouble because they've antagonized. Their, they went hard against their biggest, most powerful neighbor, who who shouldn't have who they shouldn't have gone hard against. Well, indeed, and they, they, they should have found a way to, to to get along with them. Yeah, absolutely. And their major economic heartland. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> if you look at a map, you can see why it makes absolute economic sense for the Baltic states to try to maintain good relations with Russia, but of course they didn't, and. Um, more and more people apparently are leaving the Baltic states. This is what I'm hearing. I'm not. I'm not going to pretend I'm up to date with the internal situations there. But anyway, things are not good, and they're going to get strategically worse, and they're going to get strategically much worse. But there is no Russian plan to invade them now, or next year, or the year after. That uh, danger, that risk, does not exist. But it was Zelensky. It's his interest to play it up, and he's playing it up with the Baltic states, and he's talking in the same way about Poland and Romania and Germany, most of all. And, of course, there are people, especially in Germany, I'm sorry to say, who are joining in on this game, that there is some great Russian plan to march on Berlin all over all over again, um, which, again, is... Is, is absolute foolishness. I mean, I just wanted to quickly say, as a matter of historical fact, if the Russians did get to Berlin in 1945, it was only because the Germans attacked them in 1941. Uh, that is the only scenario in which I can see the Russians going to Berlin. And that is if the Germans attack them again. I hope people in Germany, in Berlin, understand that. Once upon a time, just a few years ago, they did. Yeah. All right. So um, we're talking about uh, the the west of Russia, the east of, of Europe. Let's talk about Putin's trip to the east of Russia and uh, the Far East. He said some interesting things about the Russian economy. And we have some interesting uh, numbers coming out about the Russian economy. Everything being revised up, it seems. Steadily uh, 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 and remorselessly being revised up. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that this is, again, a tremendous contrast with Zelensky. I mean, Zelensky ha uh, wants to stay away from uh, his capital because there's a political crisis. There's a mobilization law, which, as you correctly say, hasn't got past first base. It's still stuck in the parliament. They can't agree. Uh, uh, they can't finalize it or haven't been able to finalize it up to now. Um there's worries on the part of people that if they are called up, it's a sentence of death or severe wounding or incapacitation and all of that. And so that's Zelensky. Well, Putin is able to go away into the Far East on what is in part, let's be frank about this, an election, um, you know, part of his election campaign. He's now meeting people. Remember, he's standing for president in March. So he's able to go to the Far East. He's able to meet people there. He's able to converse with them. He's traveling, note, within his own country. He's meeting people. He's taking questions from people in a way that Zelensky basically no longer is able to do. And he's full of optimism, full of bounce. And it, he's giving a fundamentally optimistic message. The war is progressing according to plan, because it is, but the economic outlook is becoming better. And he's now telling people, um, he, you know, this is in response to a question, it seems that GDP growth might again 
be revised upward for 2023. The last uh, prediction was that it would come out at 3.5% growth. It's now, there's some word now that it might be as high as 4%. Putin was careful to say this has not yet been finalised. We don't yet have the final figures. We probably will sometime in late January, early February. We'll just have to wait and see what he has to say there. But there's no doubt at all that the economy is uh, growing and growing fast. In manufacturing output is rising. Uh, real incomes are rising. People are feeling better off. And Putin also gave hints, suggestions that the inflation point, the inflation spike, has now reached its peak and that sometime next year, this year rather, we start to see inflation fall. Now, about that, here's a politician on campaign. Politicians on campaign want to give good news. Some people I know are more sceptical about the inflation numbers. I think he's probably right about this. And I think what we're going to see is inflation falling and perhaps growth easing, but easing to significantly higher levels, higher levels of growth than what we got before the original crisis. And we've had uh, data now from Rostat, the Russian Statistical Agency, and the Economics Ministry, which suggests that the underlying ability of the U Russian economy to grow has been underestimated and that growth rates from this point on will be higher than um, it was expected before that they would be. And you can see what's happening. Now, you know, I, I remember being involved in some discussions about the Russian economy about 10 years ago. And there was, I remember a school of thought which said that a lot of the in inflation that Russia suffers from is imported inflation. That the reason is that the Russians were importing a lot of subcomponents of their factories. They were importing aircraft. They were importing food products. This is before 2014, mind. And um, that made um, the cost of these things, these items, very vulnerable to exchange rate fluctuations. If the ruble fell, the prices of all of these things rose. And we saw that in a big way when the ruble devalued in 2014. There was a big inflation spike the following year, 2015, because imports became much more expensive. And also, um, if you are dependent on imported goods, if you're relying on imported goods, you don't have the same degree of ability to control their price that you would if you were manufacturing these things internally. And what Putin is saying, and again, I think this is probably true, is that as the Russian economy becomes more domestic, as the Russians set up their own supply chains, they've already largely done this with food products. But as the Russians set up their own manufacturing supply chains, as they produce their own subcomponents, as they rely less on imported products, as they are able to establish long term economic partnerships with their major trading partners, China, India, Iran, other countries, in a way that they were never ultimately able to do with the European Union, the price pressure will fall and that will contribute to a general fall in inflation. In other words, that inflation, the underlying inflation in Russia will start to come down. And this against a background of higher growth altogether. And he made a point that given that Russia is essentially a self-sufficient economy, it produces all the food it needs. It reduces all the energy products it needs. It's pre able to produce all the raw materials it has, provided it can get its supply issues sorted out, its manufacturing sorted out. So, that, you know, most products that you buy in Russian shops are made in Russia with Russian, you know, um, 
equipment and with Russian subcomponents, that ought to ultimately start to exert a downward push on inflation. And I think he's probably right. Now, this may take some time to work its way through, but I mean, it does seem to me that we are in that direction. Yeah. I like how he compares with the Russian economy to the to the EU economies. <laughs> I mean, he's he, he is taking a victory lap in a way. I mean, he's cautious. He always says we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, he says we have a lot of work ahead of us, but uh, he does take a little bit of a victory lap, which is interesting to see for Putin. Absolutely. I mean, I want to just add one other thing. I mean, we're talking about the Russian economy. We've just discussed it. And we're talking about the actual real economy in Russia. Again, I am going to the media in Britain, especially, I think also to some extent in the United States, and they're still clinging on to an in image of a Russian economy that has no reality. And I've now seen about three articles which claim that defense spending now makes up for 30 percent, three zero percent of Russian GDP. And that the only reason, supposedly, why Russia's economy has proved resilient is because of this colossal surge in defense spending and that the fact that it's become an out and out war economy. I mean, this is absolute nonsense. And I think this is something that people really do need to grasp. They're talking about Again, an economic reality that does not exist. I mean, you were there in Russia a couple of months ago. I mean, it didn't look like a war economy to you with all the shortages and rationing restrictions that you ex expect with war economies. Obviously not. Uh, but this is now, I've noticed, become the new narrative frame that it's a war economy. If you see people talk about a war economy in Russia, you can, I think, immediately say to yourself, this article you should not bother with. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is a fantasy. Um, certainly, obviously, defence spending has risen. Certainly, military production has risen significantly. But every other part of the economy is responding and growing as well. And um, um, the idea that this is a war economy in the way that, say, the United States was uh, during the Second World War is utter nonsense. The, the U.S. spends $900 billion a year on defense. So, I mean, for them to call any country a war economy is, is nonsense. Well, it's it's well, absolutely well, nonsense. Well, it, well, yeah. indeed. This is well, how they it, cope. This is their coping mechanism. It is. It is a coping mechanism. But as I said, I, I, I'm sure we're going to get people who are going to be writing to us about this. I mean, just as a few months ago, if you remember, they were telling us that the Russian budget was about to collapse. <laughs> and, uh, 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 the year before that the country was going to be pushed into default and all of these things. The latest one, as I said, there's this war economy thing. I mean, you know, you all, I'm sure, remember that about a year ago, there was a professor at Yale who was telling us it was all smoke and mirrors anyway. So, I mean, you know, we're going to, this is the latest narrative that people are coming up with. It is not a war economy. It is able to expand military production because it is so vast. Its scale and size and diversity and sophistication are continuously underestimated. They always have been. All my lifetime, they've been underestimated. And, um, you know, that is still the case. But, you know, we've now got this latest narrative about it, which has come up. And going back to what you said about the Russians planning this great war on Europe, I'm seeing, starting to see how some people are putting the war economy narrative with the Russian advance into Europe together. And they're saying that the Russians have to launch this vast invasion of Europe because that's the only way they can keep their war economy going. They live in fantasy world. All, all, all these people in, in the West, all these people coming out with these narratives, they just live in fantasy world. It's just one lie after another lie. And, and just to end the video, you know, the, the constant underestimation of Russia is the reason 
they're, they're, they are where they are with this conflict in Ukraine. It's the reason why every time they go to conflict with Russia, they always lose because exactly. it's this well, constant underestimation of, of Russia. This is absolutely correct. Man, one person has just made that point, by the way, and that's Robert Fietzo, the new prime minister of Slovakia. He's written an article and he's made exactly that very same point. He said that there is a constant failure to assess Russia properly and accurately. And instead of people taking a step back and saying to themselves, well, you know, maybe it's different from how we thought. Instead, what they do is they invent new narratives in order that they can go on with the same denials as we've seen before. All right, we'll end the video there. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop, 15% off all t shirts. Take care.